Okay, good morning everybody. Um, so welcome to this Price and Archer 2 course on Advanced OpenMP. I'm just going to go through a few preliminaries and uh, an overview of the course before we get started properly. Just like to say, please, if you have any questions or at any point, uh, please feel free to ask. Perhaps the most convenient way to do that is uh, via the chat. So you'll find that there's a uh, there's like a, a, a speech bubble icon uh, at the sort of bottom right hand side of the uh, of the of the page here. So you can you can uh, type in the in the chat window, and I'll I'll, I'll keep an eye on that as as we go along. Okay, so uh, just to be clear, if you, you are free to reuse the material um, and, um, uh, and adapt it, provided you, you, you credit uh, uh, us, um, and, uh, but, but otherwise you are, you are, you are, this, this, this material is, is essentially open and free for your, your use and redistribution. Okay, so just a very quick uh, introduction to the uh, Arch2 machine, which is what we'll be using to do the uh, practical exercises for this course. Uh, so Arch2 is the UK's national supercomputing service. Uh, it's managed by the uh, UK Research Councils uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, housed and operated and, and supported by uh, by ourselves at EPCC in the University of Edinburgh uh, and the, the hardware comes from HP Cray. So this training is, is being provided by the Arch2 Computational Science and Engineering team. Uh, so we, we run this program of courses at uh, say uh, we're now doing a, a mixture of online and on-site training at, uh, at various different places. Uh, throughout the UK. So the Arch2 system, so the full system has a little under 6,000 nodes in it. Uh, so there are 128 cores per node. So that's two 64 core AMD ROM chips. Um, so we'll, uh, for this course, obviously, we're very much focusing on the, on the uh, single node programming with uh, with OpenMP. Um, we'll be doing uh, some hybrid uh, MPI and, and OpenMP programming tomorrow. Um, so yeah, a few other details of the, of the, of the system there, but uh, the uh, single node architecture is what we're mostly concerned about. Okay, so the Arch2 website has uh, a bunch of, there's a bunch of links. Uh, so what I point you to uh, are the uh, link for the training, which you've uh, probably already found, and that uh, if you follow the link to this course, and then you will find the, the link to the, the training materials. Um, but I'll, I'll post the link to the direct link to the training materials in, in the chat window just now. So you can go there directly. There we go. Uh, we also archive all the material from past courses. Um, so you don't need to worry about downloading copies of the, of the materials for this course. They will, they will remain uh, archived on, on the website, uh, well, sort of semi-indefinitely. Um, there's also uh, links to a series of virtual tutorials. Uh, and also the documentation for the machine. So if you're having, uh, if you want to want to look up the uh, the technical documentation while you're running the practical exercises, uh, that's uh, that's where to go for that. Okay, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name's Mark Bull. I'm a senior research fellow at EPCC. Uh, I teach on our master's program in high performance computing. 
as well as doing other researchy type jobs. Uh, and I'm also the uh, our representative on the OpenMP Architecture Review Board, which is the body that develops and, and maintains the, uh, the OpenMP specification. Okay, other bits and pieces. Um, before the end of the course, we'll, we'll remind you, uh, please, please fill in the feedback form. Uh, um, we'll remind you at the end of the course and, uh, and also afterwards as well to do that. If you have a, uh, a technical query about your account that you can't solve and you want some help, for example, uh, while we're not online, to, to help you, um, so either maybe you know, out of course hours or after the course is finished uh, while, and while your accounts are still open, that's the, uh, you can uh, put a query into our, into our help desk. Um, so there's, there's the email address for that. Um, okay. So for this course, you have access to Arch 2. Um, so the uh, project is TA088 for, uh, for this course. So there's a small amount of, of, of budget available for you to, for you to run jobs. Um, so actually, we're not going to use a reservation for this, for this course um, because we're the relatively small numbers. Um, but uh, so we're going to ever get everybody to use the, uh, the, sh the short queue and I'll post details of how to have how to do that. Um, most of the time you'll be actually uh, when, when you're actually developing and testing code, it's absolutely fine to do that on the login nodes. You don't need to submit a batch job to do that. Um, but if you are interested in getting uh, reliable timing results from from the code that you write, uh, and for one or two of the other exercises, it's uh, it's useful to do that. Um, you can uh, you can uh, submit a job to the to the short queue, and you should get a fairly good turnaround from that. Um, your account will remain open after the end of the course for about two weeks or so, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but after that, the accounts will be closed and all the files will be gone. Um, so if you want to save any, any copies of, of uh, code that you've written and so on, uh, please remember to, to copy them uh, off uh, Archer 2 um, before the accounts get closed. And as I said before, all the materials are, uh, are available on the Archer 2 website and they will be archived there uh, after the course is finished. Okay, um, so we operate a code of conduct for our training courses. Um, so we uh, basically expect everybody just to behave, behave nicely. And um, so um, um, be, be welcoming, uh, use inclusive language, um, just be respectful to, to other, other, other people and, um, um, and, and so forth. Okay, so what we're going to do is going to do a, a mixture of uh, sessions where basically I'll be talking mostly, uh, and then sessions where uh, there's time for you to do the practical coding exercises, and uh, myself and my, my colleague, uh, so it's uh, Quivin today, will be uh, Kevin tomorrow, uh, will be uh, available online to help you and. Uh, answer any questions and, and help you along with the, with the, with the practical exercises. Uh, so this morning, the first session is going to cover tasks and nested parallelism and the memory model. Uh, then we'll have a break and, uh, and go into the first practical session. Um, after, after lunch break, we will do uh, some um, OpenMP tips, tricks, and pitfalls, and, and look at performance issues. 
Um, and then there's a practical session to do with uh, performance tuning. Uh, and then tomorrow, tomorrow morning, so the first session will focus on hybrid OpenMP and MPI programming. Uh, and then there's a practical session associated with this. Um, and then the, the, the afternoon session will look at uh, sort of more, uh, more recent additions to the OpenMP specification, uh, including a little bit about the uh, target offload capability. Uh, we don't have GPUs in, uh, in Archer 2, um, so you uh, won't be able to do anything uh, practical with the, with the target offload in, in this course. Um, but at least be able to give you a uh, an introduction to to how that to how that works and uh, um, give you give you some idea of uh, of what's available in, in OpenMP for offloading to GPUs and other accelerator devices. Uh, and then we'll finish up with a final session uh, if we if we need to. Um, if there's uh, still outstanding questions or uh, work that you want to do at the end. Okay, lecture notes. Okay, so I've, there's a direct link in the in the chat window for that. Um, okay, uh, so um, we'll come back to this uh, for the practical exercises. Or we'll come back to to uh, discuss that in uh, in detail when we come to the session after after coffee break. So I'll, uh, I'll leave that one for now. Okay, so does anybody have any questions before we start? So you can either so you can either either use the chat uh, facility, or you can also uh, you, you can also uh, raise your hand. So there's uh, or raise your virtual hand. So there's a little icon at the bottom next to the microphone and video. Um, there's a there's a uh, icon with a person holding an arm up. So if you if you uh, if you click on that, then I'll then I'll uh, then I'll know that you are uh, waiting to waiting to say something. Okay, good. So uh, let's get into the first topic, which is OpenMP tasks. All right, so what are OpenMP tasks here? Well, the idea here is to use tasks to identify independent units of work and in a way that is decoupled from the threads. So the normal mechanism in OpenMP is to um, the um, create a parallel region, and then every thread executes all the all the um, the block of code that's inside the parallel region. So the usual uh, parallel region and parallel loop mode of execution in, in OpenMP is uh, very much intended to or designed to use or to specify what each thread is going to do as uh, in, in a parallel way. So the idea of tasks is to essentially decouple that identification of parallel work from the actual underlying threads. 
Um, so the, the way that we do that is that the tasks are composed of a block of that code to execute and also some data to compute with. Um, so uh, instead of having or instead of having private copies of data per thread, we can have private copies of data per task. And then the tasks are going to be assigned for, for to, to threads for execution. And so, and actually as a programmer, we, don't, we have very little control how, over how this is done. We're basically handing over the control to the OpenMP runtime and say, we, we are specifying what are the parallel units of work and the runtime is then deciding to how to uh, um, schedule those to threads. So the way this works is that we have a task construct that includes a structured block of code. Uh, so when we're inside a parallel region, and this only makes sense inside a parallel region when we've got multiple threads executing, when a thread encounters one of these tasks constructs, it doesn't execute it immediately. What it does is package up that code block and any associated private data uh, for execution later. And some thread in the parallel region is going to execute that task at some point in the future. So actually it could be the thread that just encountered the, the task uh, construct and, it, and some point in the future could be right now, uh, but we don't know that. Okay, so it, all we know is that it will be executed by some thread in the parallel region at some point in the future. Uh, and then we have some guarantees about when tasks have completed. And we'll, we'll cover that in, in, in more detail. OpenMP tasks are quite powerful because they can be nested. So what does that mean? It means that a, a task itself may also contain task constructs. So while we're executing a task, that itself can generate new tasks and then its children tasks can also generate new tasks and so on. And so we can have uh, arbitrarily deep nesting of, of, of task generation. Okay, um, so this is what the syntax looks like. So for uh, OpenMP programmers is no big surprises here. Uh, so for, for Fortran, it's like OMP task uh, and OMP end task with a structured block in the middle. Uh, and for C or C++ hash pragma OMP task um, and structured, uh, structured block after that. So actually it's be a, a good point to, to just ask you all, um, uh, so see what mix of Fortran or C or, or C++ uh, programmers we've got. Um, so uh, could I just ask you to all uh, uh, type in, in the chat window which of the, uh, of the base languages you, you normally use? So it could be more than one of them. Okay. Uh, great. So it looks like we've got a pretty good mixture between Fortran and C and C++ programmers. Okay, that's great. That's useful information. So I'll uh, I'll make sure that I uh, that I mention uh, features that uh, anything that's special to um, both uh, or all the, all the base languages. So good. Thank you very much. That's that's great. Okay, so here's a very simple example to start with. Okay. 
Um, so the normal pattern uh, that we use, or the, the sort of very basic pattern uh, we use for tasks, is uh, to get one thread to generate the tasks, and then all the other threads in the parallel region are, are available to, to execute them. Um, so uh, in this case, so what we normally do, we, we need a parallel region in order to create the, our, our threads. Uh, and then the, the usual pattern is to either use a master or you can also use a single construct here. Uh, and this is, um, this is shown where uh, we have a task. So each of these function calls here, Fred, Daisy, Billy, and Molly, is, uh, is a separate task here. Okay? Um, so what's going to happen is that the, the master thread executes this block of code. It encounters all these task constructs. It will package those up and then all the other threads in the parallel region are available to execute them. Uh, and this just looks quite weird um, at first sight um, because it, you know, if, you, if you're used to OpenMP without tasks, this sort of, if you, the, uh, at first sight, this code, it looks like only one thread is doing something. Okay. Because we have a, a parallel region which just contains a master region, so it just looks like only thread zero is doing anything. Um, but what thread zero is doing here is not necessarily executing these tasks, but it's creating tasks um, to um, to be executed by by other threads. Uh, hi Laura. Uh, so, if uh, uh, while we're doing the while we're lecturing, it's uh, it's it's easier for me to to use this chat uh, to 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 see what's going on. Um, if we if we want to share more material, or uh, we can use the uh, collaborative uh, file um, during the practical sessions. But uh, while I'm while I'm talking, it's easier for me to monitor the. Uh, to monitor the, the chat window here, if that's okay. Okay, so we need some guarantees. We need to know when and where a task is going to be, going to be completed. Uh, so the first answer to that is at any thread barriers. So whether those are explicit barriers, so an explicit uh, OMP barrier directive, or the implicit barriers at the end of work sharing loops or at the end of the parallel region, um, then whenever we have a barrier, the barrier will not uh, complete until all the tasks generated in the current parallel region before the barrier have completed executing. So, uh, so uh, whenever we have a thread barrier, we guarantee that all previously generated tasks have completed before any thread proceeds past that barrier. We also have a couple of other mechanisms for uh, waiting for tasks. So the first one of these is the task wait directive. Okay. Uh, and what this says is, wait, this directive causes the, uh, the current task to wait until all tasks that were defined and generated by the current task have completed. Okay. So this is one of these standalone directives like barrier. Okay. It doesn't have any code associated with it. And it's just a standalone directive. Um, so that definition is, is slightly strange because, well, what happens if we're not inside a task? Well, uh, the, the code that's uh, in that case, 
the code that's executed by a thread in a parallel region is considered to be a task for these purposes. So the specification, uh, and if you look at the OpenMP, uh, OpenMP specification, it calls that an implicit task. So for the uh, for uh, task weight to make sense, um, that the so the code the, that a a thread executes inside a parallel region is defined to be an implicit task, and therefore a task weight uh, will cause all will cause that thread to wait for all the tasks which it generated have completed. Okay. Another thing about task weight is that in the context of nesting, it's, a, it's what's called a shallow weight. So it applies only to tasks which were generated in the current task and not to any of their descendants. So it only waits for the top level of, of, of tasks and not for any children or grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera. And then the, the third mechanism that we have is a task group region. Okay. So this construct does have a block of code associated with it. And uh, what this does is that the, uh, the, in, the encountering thread will wait at the end of the task group region until all the tasks created within that block of code have completed. And this is a deep wait. So this waits for uh, children and grandchildren and all the descendant tasks created within that structured block. So a very simple example here would be uh, so same pattern or parallel region with a master construct. So the master thread is uh, is going to generate some tasks. So it generates task with a with a function called Fred and another task and function called Billy, and then it calls task weight. There's a task weight directive. So in this case, that means that uh, at this point the master thread will wait uh, until all the tasks which it has already generated have completed. So at this point, the master thread will be blocked until the Fred and Daisy tasks have completed. And only then will the master thread continue and generate the, the Billy task. Um, so that's one way of enforcing some ordering between tasks. So in, in this case, this guarantees that the Fred and Daisy tasks will execute before the Billy task. But there are there are more, uh, we'll, which we'll come to. There are there are uh, more uh, fine grained uh, mechanisms for enforcing ordering between in, between tasks. Okay, so let's look at more, uh, a more concrete or, or, or possibly more useful uh, example uh, or use case for, for, for tasks. Um, so one of the things that tasks is useful for is where we have parallelism in a while loop. So if we have a, have a while loop, then we, we, we can't use the standard OpenMP work sharing loop directives. So we can't use uh, OMP do or OMP for uh, be, uh, in cases where it's not possible for the runtime to compute how many loop iterations there are going to be before the loop starts executing. Um, so uh, an example of that would be a, a, a classic so linked list traversal. Okay, so we have uh, some code that uh, that looks like this. Okay, 
So um, basically linked list is just the data structure where every element in every item in the list contains a pointer to, to the next item. Um, so we start off by getting a, a, uh, a pointer to the, the head of the list and storing that in P. Uh, and then we enter a while loop. So while P is not a null pointer, then we are going to do some, uh, basically do some work on that item in the list. So I'll call some function process and uh, basically interested in the case where all the calls to process are independent. So we'd like to be able to, to execute them on, on different threads. And, uh, and then we get the, from this item, we get the, uh, we get the pointer to the next item in the list uh, and we keep going uh, along, the, along the list, uh, traversing the list and calling process for, for every item. So assuming that the, the items can be, the, the process calls can be done independently for the different items, how can we, how can we parallelize this? So we can't directly use uh, an OpenMP loop directive here. So this case is soluble without using tasks, but uh, it's, rather, it's rather messy and not very efficient. What you would need to do is, first of all, traverse the list and count how many items there are in it. Uh, and then you could allocate an array of pointers of that size, one for every item, and then traverse the list again and record, you know, to make a copy of, of all, the, uh, all the pointers to the, to the list items in the array. And then you could use a, a normal for or do loop to traverse the array and call process with, with every item. Um, so, well, it's rather messy, needs some extra coding, not very efficient because you have these two sequential traversals of the, of the list, one to do the count, one to copy the pointers before you get to do anything, anything in parallel. So it's not that you can't do this without tasks, it's just that tasks make this, uh, make this a lot more convenient. So the way this would look with OpenMP tasks is, so again, I'm going to use this, uh, this parallel master uh, pattern here. So parallel region to create our threads, then the master thread is going to traverse the, the list. So it gets the point at the head of the list and goes along it, it goes into the while loop. Uh, and then we're going to include every call to process inside a, a task construct. So the master thread traverses the list, uh, packages up the tasks, and all the other threads are, are available to, to execute them. The tricky bit here is the, uh, the use of first private, because uh, what we need is that when, uh, so think about when a thread is, uh, executes the task and calls process, what is the value of P that it's going to access here? And uh, for this to work, what we need is that the value of P here should be the value that P had when the master thread generated the task. Okay. Uh, and that's what the first private clause here is doing. So what that does is that when the master thread generates the task, it also makes a copy of P with its current value uh, and stores that along with the task. And that's what will be used when the task executes. Okay. Because the master thread, you know, by the time otherwise, by the time the, the task gets executed, 
the master thread is further down the list and, and, and the value of P in the master thread has, has changed. So a question from Lorenzo, same mechanism we used to in range loops where we traverse containers like maps. Uh, yes, you could do that. You could do it like that. Yeah. The other thing to note is that we, we really have no idea and no control over which thread is going to execute which task. That's entirely down to the OpenMP runtime. And we just have to trust that it's going to do a sensible job of scheduling them. Um, the nice thing is that you, uh, you expect to get some automatic load balancing. So if these, um, you know, if these calls to process take, take different amounts of time, then the, uh, the runtime will, will take care of, of, of trying to load balance the, the, the tasks across the, across the threads. Okay, so just to just kind of emphasize what's really going on underneath here is, um, okay, so we have thread zero, the master thread is basically, what it's doing is traversing the list and, and packaging up the tasks. Okay. Uh, and then all the other threads are basically just, uh, they don't have any explicit code to execute, but they're just sitting there waiting for, for tasks to appear. And as, they, uh, as the master thread generates them, the other threads are are basically uh, in a loop uh, inside the runtime, uh, executing executing the tasks. Um, but then, when thread zero is finished, there's nothing to stop it joining in as well. Okay, so once once uh, once the master thread uh, once the master construct has finished, we've got to the end of the list, uh, and then perhaps there's there's uh, still a whole bunch of outstanding tasks. Um, it's perfectly uh, possible that that thread zero can can also join in the in the execution as well. Um, but all all that we know is that by the time we get to the the barrier at the end of the parallel region, then we know that all the tasks have uh, have been executed by that point. So this parallel master or parallel single pattern is, is quite common, but we're not restricted to that. It's perfectly okay for more than one thread or all the threads in the parallel region to, to generate tasks. Okay, um, so here's a little extension to that example. So suppose instead of one linked list, um, we had uh, a, a collection of linked lists. So we want to traverse them all uh, and, and generate tasks from them. Okay, so, to, so ignoring the OpenMP for a minute, okay, so we've got a loop over lists and then for each of these lists we're going to do the same thing, get the, get the pointer to the head of it and then, and then, and then traverse it. Okay, um, so what we could do in that case, we could actually so create our parallel region, um, and then we could uh, we could use an OMP4 directive on this loop. Okay, so this is a this is a, a normal conforming for loop, so that's fine. So what that's going to do is the uh, the traversal of the lists is going to be shared out between the threads. So different threads are going to traverse different lists and they're all going to, to generate tasks. Uh, and then at some point, those tasks will, will all get executed as well. 
Um, so this is actually an, uh, sort of an, an illustration of where we can get some useful benefit from, uh, from, from tasks because we are getting essentially all this load balancing for free. So we might have you know, nasty irregular cases like this where for example, the, uh, the li each list contains a very different number of items. So you know, it's got some short lists and some long lists. And then the cost of, cause of calling process uh, on, uh, on each one is very different. Uh, then you know, if without tasks, we'd have to uh, say, again, it's not impossible, but we'd probably have to work quite hard um, to get a well load balanced solution to that potentially. But by using tasks like this, then essentially we're just you know, exposing all the parallelism uh, available and the runtime can schedule those tasks uh, as it sees fit and, and, keep all the, and try to keep all the threads busy. Okay, uh, any, any questions about that? Okay, good. So as we've seen with the, you know, that first private example, then there's something a bit more complicated going on with data attribute scoping uh, with respect to tasks. So let's look at that in a little, a little bit more detail. Uh, so, um, The way it works with tasks is that variables can be shared or private or first private with respect to a task rather than with respect to a thread. Um, so, well, actually these concepts are, are really at some level the same as with, uh, um, as with threads. And in particular, they, you know, if, if we ever use, and we'll come to that in, uh, uh, next, uh, talk about nested parallelism, then uh, these kind of concepts all, all do mesh together. Um, but you know, the way to think about it uh, with, uh, uh, with tasks, we need, we need to think about it a little bit differently. Okay. So the way, the, uh, the way, to, way to understand these is, uh, okay, let's look at, for, first of all, shared. So variable is a shared on a task construct. What that means is the references to it inside the construct are to the storage with that name at the point where the task was encountered. Okay. So whatever, whatever thing that was, you know, wherever that memory location was uh, at the point where the task was generated, that same memory location will be used when the task executes if it's uh, if it's shared the complicating factor is that that original storage or that existing storage could be private with respect to the thread or private with respect to an enclosing task. Okay. So we have to think about this at, uh, at different levels of, essentially you have to think about how this works at different levels of nesting. But basically shared says, use the existing storage. Okay, don't create any, don't create any new copies. So private is, is, is straightforward. Um, so what happens with private is that when the task executes, we will get a new copy and like private for, for threads, that copy is uninitialized. Um, so that gets created when the task is executed and when the task is finished, it goes out of scope and, uh, and, and is lost. 
So it's, it's simply just a private copy for the duration of the, of the task execution. Uh, and then the third possibility, which we've already seen the example for, is, is first private. So when we have first private, okay, the, uh, the references uh, inside the task are to this new storage, which is that this is created when the task is encountered and generated, okay, and it's initialized with a copy of the value from the existing storage. Okay. So we make a new, we make new storage for that task and copy the existing value into it at the point where the task is generated. And then that's what gets used when the, when the task executes. So that's, uh, so it's, at some level, it's not different to, uh, it's not really different to what we do with, with threads but we do need to think about it in, in, in a slightly different way uh, uh, to, to make sense of it. And the thing to be aware of here is, um, is that the defaults are different from what we have with threads, okay? So, we don't specify shared private, first private, or reduction on a parallel region, then the default is, is always shared. However, for, for tasks, that's not true, okay? Um, so the default is, uh, is first private, uh, except that, okay, so um, uh, except for variables that are, that are shared all the way out, um, to the in, in all the enclosing um, contexts. Okay, um, so suppose so this is it's easy to see with an example here. Okay, so so we have a parallel region of uh, uh, A shared and B private. Yeah. Okay. If we have a, a task construct and we don't specify anything explicit then uh, inside the task because uh, A is shared all the way down you know, so, uh, and including any other constructs you know, other parallel regions or uh, work sharing regions. If, if A is, is shared all the, is still shared at the point where, they, where the task is uh, encountered, then A will be shared inside. Uh, on the other hand, so uh, B is, is private to a thread um, so this is the different one. So B will be first private by default inside. Okay. Uh, and then anything, you know, like, like with threads, anything that's declared inside the scope of the task will be, is, is automatically private. So if we declare C inside here, then, then that's going to be, uh, going to be uh, automatically private. So having explained that, um, I would basically say, okay, uh, hang on a moment. Let me explain that. I would say that, okay, um, I always am quite, uh, I always advise people to use default none uh, for, for parallel regions, okay, and not to rely on uh, the default behavior. It's, it's too dangerous and, and, and too easy to make mistakes and, and end up with accidental race conditions. Um, and I think that that advice is even more applicable for tasks. So I would always uh, advise you to use, so default none is, is available for the, is a, is, a, is a clause that's available on the task construct. Uh, and that forces you to declare everything that's used inside the task explicitly uh, as either shared first private or private. And to, um, you know, to force yourself to, you do have to think carefully about, about that. Uh, and using default none basically forces you to do that, forces you to make explicit decisions for, 
for, for all the variables and I, I would strongly advise you to, to do that. Okay, so another use case where tasks are uh, tasks come in handy is if we want to exploit uh, parallelism from recursion. So this is every computer scientist's favorite recursion example because it fits in less than 10 lines of code. Um, so this is the, 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 uh, the, the, the stupid and thoroughly inefficient order n squared recursive implementation of computing Fibonacci numbers. Okay. So Fibonacci numbers, where it's just every number in the series is, is, uh, is just the sum of the, is the previous two. Um, so we can write very simple code for that. Okay. So we have a recursive function fib, which takes the, uh, takes in, takes the value. Okay. So we declare two local variables, X and Y. Um, if, if we're down at the bottom, okay, so if n is less than two, then we just simply return. So, okay, if we get down to one, then we just, just return one. Otherwise, we make two recursive calls, you know, call fib for n minus one, fib for n minus two, uh, and then return the sum of the results. Uh, and then we need some, uh, we need to kick off the recursion at the top level. So, for example, if we're interested in computing the 5,000th Fibonacci number, um, we simply call the make the top level call to the recursive function um, with the value 5000 at, at the top. Okay. Um, so clearly there's, uh, there's parallelism available uh, as we as we go down the tree. Okay, so it's, very, it's, a, it's a binary tree so we're branching all the way down and um, so there's there's opportunity to uh, to execute in, in, in parallel here. Um, but this one, this one is really very difficult uh, to do uh, without tasks, without extensive rewriting of the code. So you basically have to, uh, if you wanted to do this um, with normal OpenMP, then uh, you would basically need to rewrite this without recursion, which is always possible. Right? Um, but it's, uh, it's again, it's, it's a bit, bit messy and un unpleasant. Okay, so here's the implementation um, with, with tasks. Okay, uh, so this takes a little bit of thinking about because recursion is always a little bit tricky to, uh, uh, to reason about. So what we do here is what we're going to do is basically make each of these recursive calls into, into a task. Okay, so I have one task for the, the uh, first recursive call, another task for the second recursive call. Okay, uh, so that's so much so easy. Okay, then what we need to do is have some, we need some synchronization here. Okay, so before we can uh, add X and Y together, we need to, we need to ensure that these two tasks have completed. So we can do that with a task weight here. Okay. Um, so you think, oh, well, that's, uh, is that okay? Um, because task weight is a sh weight, but we've got recursive calls here. So although each task weight individually is only waiting for these two tasks and not their children, each of the children is in turn waiting for its children. Okay, so we have this, we have, uh, we, have we basically have a, a deep weight by, by sort of, uh, by stealth, if you like. Okay, because we've got a shallow weight at each, at each level of, uh, of the recursion. Okay. So that's it. The tricky bit here is these shared clauses. Okay, so this is what's not immediately obvious that this is the right thing to do. Okay, so 
have to think, okay, what are X and Y? So they are local variables declared inside this recursive function. So every time this is called, we will get a new copy of X and Y, and they will be private to the current task. Okay, because they're declared inside the, inside the current task. But the point is here is that we really want this X to refer to the thing that we just declared. Okay, and this Y to refer to the thing that we just declared. And, and that's why we have to declare these as shared here. So shared here, remember, it means use the existing storage with that name. So that's what that does. That makes sure that this X here is really the thing we just declared, the same memory location as the thing we just declared, and not a new copy. Okay, we can't do it. We don't want a new copy because otherwise, when we come to use, uh, to add X and Y together here, any new copies will have gone out of scope. Any, any first private or private copies associated with the tasks will have gone out of scope at this point. So we can't use them. So we have to declare, uh, we have to declare them as, as shared here. Uh, and we really do need to declare them because the default would actually be first private. Okay. So that's a little bit, that's a little bit tricky. So then all we need to do is uh, at the top level is to use this this parallel master pattern again. Okay, so a parallel region to create our threads, uh, and then it, we basically make the top level calls of fib in uh, on the on thread zero, uh, and then let the recursion unwind. So uh, it will create two tasks. They will get scheduled probably to different threads. So they in turn will each create two tasks, and, and so on and so on down down the tree. Okay, hey, any questions about that? Okay, good. Um, so just the, the, the bits of advice about using tasks. Okay, so as we've seen, getting this data attribute scoping can be quite tricky uh, because the defaults are different from, from other, con other constructs. Uh, so yeah, just to emphasize, use, always use default none. Force yourself to think about what you're doing with, uh, with the shared private and, and first private declarations. Okay. Um, Next point is, you know, uh, just don't use tasks for things which are already well supported by other things in OpenMP. So um, you, you, you almost, you almost, you very rarely want to use tasks for to for standard do or for loops, uh, because the overhead of using tasks is is bigger. Okay, there's, there's some overhead associated with um, packaging up the tasks. Uh, and also essentially uh, dequeuing those tasks and, and executing them. So that, that's not for free. There is some additional overhead um, compared with just treating it as a, uh, a normal standard uh, parallel loop. Um, there are cases where it is useful even for standard loops. Um, so particularly if you have uh, nested loops and very irregular workloads. Um, so if you want to exploit parallelism from uh, more than one loop in a nest and nothing's load balanced nicely, then tasks can be, can be a good solution in that case. And nested tasks uh, can be a good solution. 
because you're, you're essentially, what it essentially allows you to do is basically just specify all the available parallelism from all the levels in the in, in the loop nest um, and, and let the runtime sort out all the, all the load balancing. Um, but so, uh, you know, uh, in general, the runtime implementations are reasonably good, um, but you can't expect miracles. Okay. Um, and usually, what you need to do is to take some control over how many tasks are generated and how much computation there is in each task. So that's what I mean by the granularity of the tasks here. Okay. Um, if we try and create millions and millions of tasks with you know, tiny amounts of, uh, of, of work in them, so like that Fibonacci example I've just showed you, okay, there's almost no work inside. Uh, you know, the, the amount of work inside a task is, is, you know, is, is nothing. It's like one addition. Okay? Um, so um, generating tasks with tiny amounts of work, lots and lots of tasks with tiny amounts of work in them, isn't going to work out well. We're just going to drown in the in the, in the overhead. Um, so you might have to work a little bit harder to uh, to take some control over over the granularity. Um, and you know maybe you probably you might need to expose that granularity as a, in a as something that you can uh, you know, as, a, as a parameter that you can vary. Uh, because the right granularity will often depend on the input data uh, and the number of threads that you're executing and, and so on. Okay, so it can be hard to uh, predict what the what the right what the right task granularity is going to be. Um, so it's good to be able to to write code where that's that's parameterized in some way. Okay, so just take our examples again. So for example, the uh, list traversal, the linked list traversal example, what you might want to do is instead of making uh, every, uh, every item a task, you might want to group them up. Okay, so you might want to have uh, a set of, of, of items uh, as, as, a, uh, as a task. Okay, so you might need to, to refactor your code. So instead of, so the process actually does n items at a time instead of one. Okay and internally traverses the list. Um, and then you create a, uh, a, you make that into a, into a task. Okay, um, and then to get the next task, you need to skip n items ahead in, in, in the list. So the master thread would need to, 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 to skip the next n items in the list um, and then generate a new task for the next, that processes the next n items at a time, okay. So that gives you a parameter, okay? So, so n, n items becomes a becomes a tunable parameter, which you can uh, which you can adjust to to try and uh, to, to maximize the performance. Okay, if you're if you have too many tiny tasks, you're going to drown in overheads. If you have too few big tasks, then you won't keep your threads busy all the time. Um, so there's normally some compromise region in the middle, which is going to give you the the best performance, but it's hard to predict what that's going to be. And uh, we can uh, basically so play the play the same um, kind of trick with the uh, with the recursion as well. Okay, uh, so another possibility here is to in the, in this case the the task construct takes an if clause. Okay. So if the if the condition in the if clause evaluates to true, then a task will be generated. If it evaluates to false, then it won't generate a task. The encountering thread will just execute the block of code. Okay. Um, so for example, here we could control it by by stopping creating tasks at some level in the tree. Okay. So once we get down to you know, uh, for once, once n is, uh, is 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 smaller than some value, then we don't create any more tasks below that. We just simply let the um, let the recursion unwind sequentially uh, in inside the current task. So again, that gives you a a, a mechanism for having control over the. And you can adjust the value of level here 
to, to uh, adjust the number and, and the granularity of the tasks that are created. Okay, any, that's the end of tasks. Any, any questions? Perhaps can I ask a question, um, not writing, just verbally? Sure. Uh, so, um, so task, if you're creating a task, isn't it the data would be private by default to each, uh, each uh, threads or processes? Okay, so if it's, if it's currently, say, the rules are a little bit complicated. It's, yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> okay, uh, by default, uh, if whatever it is, is is shared at that level, okay, R right, uh, right. If it's you know if it's if it's still the original if it still refers to the original storage that existed before the parallel region, then it will still be shared, right? So, so for uh, example, if I don't put uh, shared A and private B, right, and I have uh, pragma OMP parallel, so let's say I created four uh, four threads. So the idea is that yeah. we want to explicitly um, uh, want to t tell thread to do explicit task in a sense, right? Not, not that every thread should work on the same uh, uh, program, maybe on the different data, but different program, right? Um, okay. So if I am not using shared and I have, let's say, multiple uh, pragma OMP task uh, function, compute one, compute two, for example, just to make it yeah. simpler, compute A, yeah. compute B, compute C, then, yeah. then that means that each, uh, let's, say, uh, let's say you have three threads, so each thread will have a separate value, will not have a copy of B, C, right? For example, thread A could have one. Is it true or no? If I misunderstood that. Okay, I think um, how would you uh, how do we isolate uh, uh, processes plus data together on each thread? Is it like by default? So, That's why well, we each yeah, if, if each if each task is working on a different if each task is working on a different piece of data. Mm -hmm. then it's okay for them to be shared. It's the same with threads, right? If each thread is working on a different piece of data, then it's okay, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They can be shared. And it's the same with tasks, okay? So if each, each task is working on a different piece of data, it's okay for that variable to be, to be shared. Mm -hmm. But if you want a private copy, yeah. If you want private copies, so yeah, it, it depends very much on, on the. Uh, okay, <laughs> I might have to get you to write, I have to get you to write down an example here to, to, to show you exactly what you want. Okay, uh, because it's so you know, the by default, so variables. Yeah. yeah. My question is: so by default, data is shared always. If I don't declare no. anything, I won't tell any pragmas. No, no, it's not unfortunate. No, it's not unfortunately. Okay. Um, because if for anything that's private, the default behavior on the task is first private. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so it depends. You know what? Um, if you know, if we reach this point uh, at this point here where the task construct is executed. Okay. So A is shared. So it remains shared. Mm -hmm. But B is private to a thread. So we will get a first private copy of, of B for every task. And, and that is just confusing, right? So you know, I, I strongly recommend that you just ignore the defaults. Right? Yeah, and because I, just, was, I just would like to, know, uh, uh, to want to understand how the default behavior of task or, or standard OMP parallel loops, for example, if you're just working with the loops. Yeah, because they're, they're different. Okay, so the default for default on parallel is everything is 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 shared, right? Yeah. The default behavior is shared. Mm -hmm. For a task, the default behavior depends mm -hmm. on 
what it is in the enclosing context. It could either be shared or first private, depending on the, on the nature of that variable in the enclosing context. So is it, fair, is it safe to say that uh, we could use a uh, task when we know that uh, the each of, let's say, function working independently, then uh, want to find out the best use case of task, for example, it, because all this code could be done by standard uh, OpenMP. Yeah, so again, so yeah, so while loops is a good example, recursion is a good example, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. where you have nested parallelism and bad load balance problems, that's another mm -hmm. good use case. Yeah, yeah. so there's, there's really two, there's, there's, there's kind of two advantages to tasks, okay? Um, one is to be able to, uh, to have this decoupling of specifying the independent units of work from actual threads. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another one is this ability to have everything load balanced for you. Okay. So if you have very, it's uh, tasks are good for very irregular parallelism um, uh, in general. Okay. I mean, the simple case, if you just have a loop with iterations, with, um, with un, you know, unbalanced iterations, then you can use one of the loop schedule clauses. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there are more complicated cases where you're not in a simple loop, you're in nest, you know, you have nested parallelism or, uh, you know, one of these while loop type things, um, then, then you can't really use a, a simple loop to do that. Yeah. Right. So, but, but if, so let's say that if you have a nest, simple nested loop, not conditional, uh, um, we use, often we use collapse, for example, how would you be yeah. different than? Well, I mean, so not every, yeah, if you have a simple case, then you can use collapse, right? But not, not everything is simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, and there are, you know, uh, collapse only applies if it's a, uh, a, a perfect nest perfect loop yeah. nest and it's and it's rectangular in which case yeah. yeah collapse is fine but there are uh there are other cases which where collapse doesn't apply so, yeah yeah okay yeah. thank you thank you very much okay uh laura hi laura go for it No, we can't hear you. In the meantime, uh, Laura is coming back. Uh, I can shoot another question if you don't mind. Okay, go for it. Is the idea of task is very similar to stream as a uh, uh, by default streams as CUDA has? I mean, it's, it's conceptually quite similar. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because by default, you, you generate kind of a stream and you have many multiple tasks, which is due to one after another. But yes. here in task, uh, you don't, the order is not important, right? Um, so I'll, I'll come back to showing, I'll, uh, I'll, um i'll come back later on okay in a, a tomorrow uh and we'll talk about more about how you can do dependencies between tasks there is a way of doing it hi sorry now the microphone works great uh, can i it. ask can i ask uh, what happens at the slide 16 in the Fibonacci example, if I don't put the oh, Pragma OMP master, I didn't understand that. Okay, if you don't have the master here, then every thread will call the top level. So you will just replicate the entire computation on every thread. Ah, okay, okay. 
because there is yeah, like okay okay thank you yeah okay so yeah it just looks weird right it's, it's a slightly odd pattern to get used to is that you only want you know you only want to start one fib computation and not not replicate it on every thread yeah yeah, it's like not putting a do in the parallel do when you have an iteration, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, yes. Thank so you. Just, just, a, just a raw parallel region, everything gets executed by all the threads. Yeah. Okay. And in addition, actually, uh, only master thread, which leads from beginning to end, and you always wanted master to control kind of uh, last output, in a sense, right? Sorry, can you say that again, please? Uh, so in a sense, the master's thread is the only thread which leads from the beginning to end, and it's, it's kind of a controller of the last output, like which carries the so it will have the result, yes. yes. Yeah. Well, in this case, uh, yeah, yeah, still in the part of open and Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Ashutosh asked, in the film example, n would be first private. Uh, yes, that's correct. N will be first private by default. Yeah. Can we can we use for example when when we are working with uh, IOs right uh, where we are storing two different data in a file can we use task there I mean can can it be use case a better use case for that for doing IO yes uh, yes but very <laughs> <laughs> okay um, in 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 most hardware, there is very little point in doing I/O from multiple threads, yes, yes. because the disk accesses are will just get sequentialized anyway. In, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so there's there's uh, on the whole there's there's really not much benefit from trying to mm -hmm. uh, trying to parallelize your I/O across multiple threads. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's another question here. Okay, if the variable is declared already out of scope, it's already first private. Uh, I'm not sure I quite follow you there, wouldn't you? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Uh, so um, I was just wondering in the Fibonacci function over there, um, so we have X and Y variables declared in the function. And mm -hmm. I wonder what happened if I, I pass those value at, um, as, um, as arguments of that function. Should I like do something that like, closes? some clauses for those variables, if that's the case. Well, if you pass them by value, yeah. then you also have a, then they are also local variables, right? You also, they are also local copies. Okay. Uh, if you pass pointers to them, mm -hmm. then that's different. <laughs> so like, for instance, if, if I want to pass a, a vector as a reference into a function. And mm -hmm. I wonder if I still need to like specify them as shared variables or shared like entities. And I want to uh, wrap them up with task. The answer is probably yes. Right? Okay. Okay. Because uh, it, well, it depends what you want. Okay. If, if you just want a copy that you're going to, th if it's okay to throw away that copy when the task's finished, 
then then you can make them private, right? Okay, but I'm I'm I mean I mean with my eyes it looks like those X and Y um are in a in sort of like race condition in that function because I cannot really understand fully at the moment. Okay, yeah, I mean it's, it, it is complicated. Okay, so you have to remember that most most of the time this is this is being called from inside a task. Mm -hmm. Okay, so apart from the top level. This is, you know, this is always being called from inside some task. Okay. Uh, so X and Y are local variables. So you, so every every time you call fib, you get a new copy of X and Y. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those are private copies. Okay, okay. every task gets a new. Every time you call this, the, the, that's a new copy for every task. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the point is that you know, we are now creating children tasks mm -hmm. here and here. Yeah. So in, we are now inside where this reference is now inside a different task. This is inside a child task mm -hmm. here. Because it's local. Right. Mm -hmm. So th this is just a use of this variable inside the child task. Okay. But we want what we what we need to arrange is that this x here actually mm -hmm. refers to the same memory location as this one. Right. Okay. We need that because when we use it here. Okay. So. Uh, this is not inside a, a child task, okay? So this X here definitely refers to that, right? Yeah, you understand that. Okay. Yeah, so we need this, you know, in order to use the return value here, we also need to make sure that this value of this reference to X also refers to this thing. Right, oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, but if we didn't say shared here, then by default, we would get a new copy of X, oh, yeah. right? Which would be fine, okay? But it goes out of scope, right? So this task finishes as soon as this has executed, as soon as this statement is executed, that task then completes, and that first private copy of X goes out of scope. Right. Okay, that disappears. Oh. What you refer to, to here won't won't pick up the value. Oh. Okay. What what you're referring to here will be an un, will still be the original uninitialized thing here. Yeah, very um, much. Yeah. Not what, was, not what was assigned here. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank yeah. you. No, it is uh, it's it is it is tricky okay <laughs> yeah never really used task um so far yeah We're yeah just no, that's, this, this is the tricky bit of tasks is 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 thinking about the the shared and shared private and first private for sure okay. thank you very much thank you're welcome you. um So Mao Yang says, every private variable has its local copy. Uh, so private variables need more memory. Yes, okay, so every, every time you use a private variable, you're consuming some, some memory. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that could eventually be a problem, okay? So if you, have, uh, if, you have, if you create lots and lots of tasks, then you could, uh, you could consume a significant amount of memory if you're making uh, first private copies of or private copies of of, of a lot of variables, um, that could be could be a problem. Um, the runtime has some discretion about what it does. So what do I mean by that? It, the runtime is has some ability to try and avoid running out of memory and okay. so it's what can happen is that so uh, let's go back to the 
this is a bit of this is a little bit simplistic actually okay because uh, what 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 is actually possible to happen is that uh, if the runtime at some point finds that there are too many outstanding tasks which uh, and that's using up a lot of memory for example it's actually possible for the runtime to suspend thread zero from executing this loop okay go away and so make thread zero go and execute some tasks for a bit and then go back into the loop and and and, and start generating again so in general the runtime does have that ability uh to uh to try and prevent itself from from running out of running out of memory and okay. so there'll usually be some you know some upper bound on the number of tasks or the amount of memory that's currently consumed by the being consumed by the out, outstanding tasks and the runtime does have that ability to say okay there's too many outstanding tasks uh, I will stop this thread doing this loop here, get it to go away and consume some, some tasks for a bit, uh, and then resume generating again later on. So run runtime does actually have that, have that ability to do that. And that helps it, uh, helps prevent it from, from running out of, uh, running out of memory. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, I have a, I have a little question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Right. Uh, one thing I kind of like intrigued me and scared me at the same time about task is that it said that we don't really know which thread is doing what. Right. And uh, so in the, in the, in, in a framework of nested parallelism, I'm thinking about like large core count machine, like the AMD ROM, where we have, uh, you know, uh, also multiple level of caching so we, we would like to know exactly what threads do what because we want to exploit our locality to, right. you know, to improve like bandwidth so we essentially we task the old concept of our locality goes off the window because we don't Correct. really know so we yeah. have to be careful in that in that case to design yeah. the application yes yeah so yeah so any uh any any locality is um, yeah is difficult to exploit or difficult to control with tasks because you've no idea which thread's going to execute what. Okay, now that's that's good to know in, in design when you design the code. Yeah. Um, so some and, and you don't really know what the runtime is doing. Uh, so the runtimes are tend to be designed to try and do something sensible which would be to preferentially execute recently generated tasks and preferentially generate preferentially execute tasks which were recently generated by the current thread okay mm. so um you know it will try to do something but that doesn't always work So that's you know that's an attempt to to try and uh, improve locality but it, it you know it depends on what they um they said yeah sometimes that just doesn't work okay anything else Matt. Uh, okay. Uh, do you want to type?
Okay, go for it. Okay, slide 11. Benefit of using tasks, generating the tasks in the first loop. Determine the load balancing in the second loop. Uh, not quite sure what you're asking here. But in, in general, the, 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 um, the benefit of using, uh, of using, one benefit of using tasks is that the, the, the runtime will try to balance all the, uh, to load balance all the tasks across all the threads. So, so this slide is basically just a, this is, this is not real code, okay? This is, um, uh, so in order to do the balance, the runtime must know all the tasks beforehand. No, okay, it just does it, it does, it, it does dynamic load balancing as the tasks are generated. Um, so normally what, what happens is that the, uh, the runtime has an internal queue or uh, an, in, um, uh, uh, actually, it would typically be multiple queues, but anyway, you could think of it just have, having as, as an, an internal queue of tasks. Okay, um, so uh, basically, uh, when tasks are generated, they are added to the queue. Uh, when tasks are, are executed, they're taken off the queue. Okay, so whenever a thread becomes available, it just takes the next next task off the queue, whichever one it happens to be. Okay, and so, so like that, it, uh, it basically does try to do some uh, basically dy dynamic load balancing. So whenever a thread becomes available, it just takes the next available or a next available task. So it's not doing any, uh, it's, it's not doing static load balancing. Okay, so I mean, this is, this is just a sketch, right? So actually, as soon as the uh, as soon as the first task has been generated by thread zero, then some other other thread can can start consuming it, start executing it. Ah, okay, great. Okay, I nothing else, and I think we we better move on. Okay, so this session is about nested parallelism. 
Um, so, yes, nested parallel is supported in OpenMP in the sense that we can nest parallel regions. So, if a parallel directive is encountered within another, within, within an existing parallel construct, we'll get a new team of threads created. Okay. Um, so, normally, this is disabled by default. So, you have to request this to be enabled with either with the OMP nested environment variable or by calling OMP set nested in, inside the code. Okay. So normally what happens by default and if nested parallel is disabled, what happens is, is the code will still execute, but the inner teams will only ever contain one thread. So they won't actually create any, any, any additional threads. Uh, it's usually disabled by default because it actually incurs some additional overhead runtime to support it. Uh, it, it, it makes the, sort of the internal bookkeeping in the runtime more complicated. Um, so it's, uh, it's often, most implementations do disable it by default. Okay, so a very simple example, we can, we can do something like this. Uh, so, for example, if we had uh, two uh, separate loops here, okay, so I've got uh, uh, a loop which sets some value in an array X and another loop that sets a value in, sets some values in, a, in an array Y. Uh, then we can, for, we, uh, suppose we want to not only execute each loop in, in itself in parallel across multiple threads, but have both these loops also executing concurrently, um, then, then we can do that. Okay, so just a very simple example. So if we arrange for there to be two threads in the outer parallel region, we can simply say, okay, for uh, thread zero in the outer parallel region, will itself create a new team of threads to execute this loop in parallel? Let me find my pointer here, okay execute this loop in parallel. Uh, otherwise, uh, thread one in the outer parallel region will in turn create its own team of threads and, and execute this loop in parallel. So we you know, can end up with, say for example, if each, each of these creates four threads, then we can end up with, uh, we will end up with eight threads executing at the same time, four of them doing this loop, four of them doing, doing this loop. So in practice, I think you know, uh, th there aren't that many applications uh, that, that really need nested parallel regions. It's a relatively uncommon use case. Uh, it can be useful if the, sometimes if we do have uh, you know, multiple levels of parallelism in the code, but the, uh, and the outer level is, is worth exploiting but doesn't contain enough parallelism to keep all our threads busy. Okay, so maybe particularly as we're you know, looking at hardware with higher and higher core counts, then you know, you might be, there might be a constraint or the, you know, the, the natural outer level of parallelism isn't big enough. It doesn't have enough independent tasks uh, to, uh, to keep all, all our threads busy. I say nested tasks is an alternative. Um, so um, you should always think about that, okay? So if you have this problem of multiple levels of parallelism, you do actually have these sort of two alternative mechanisms. You have nested parallel, you can either exploit it with nested parallel regions, or you can use um, nested, uh, nested tasks. Um, and which one is better uh, is, depends on the application. It really depends on whether you have, uh, whether everything is well load balanced or not. Okay? If everything's, uh, if, uh, if, you know, if all our, uh, if everything takes, you know, if everything's well going to be well load balanced and everything's going to take the same amount of time and you also care about locality, for example, so good question. Last session, 
then nested parallel regions might be a good solution. However, if everything's a lot more irregular, uh, then you might want to go the, the, the nested tasks route. Okay. So Laura asks in the previous example, what's the difference with teams of threads? Right. Target. Right, so in this case, I'm just creating nested teams. Okay, so I've got a parallel region which itself contains parallel regions. Okay, does that answer the question or, or not? Okay. So you have this choice, yeah. So, so for, for very regular problems, you might want to use nested parallel regions. For more irregular computations, then then nested tasks might might be a better solution. Um, how do you control the number of threads? Okay, so uh, if you, as long as you want the same number of threads at uh, for all the inner teams, you can just use the environment variable OMP num threads. It actually accepts a comma separated list of values, which says how many threads to use for each level of parallelism. Okay. So in this case, if I could, if I specify OMP thread number threads equals two comma four, that's going to use two threads at the outer level and, and four threads for each of the each of the inner teams. Uh, okay, and I can extend that. You know, I can have you know if I have three levels of parallelism, I can do two comma four comma six or whatever I want. You've also got more, uh, so that's okay as long as you want every inner region to have the same number of threads, which is probably a pretty common use case, um, but you're not restricted to that. You can use uh, OMP set num threads clause or the num, uh, as num so OMP set num threads function, uh, runtime, runtime library function, or the OMP, or the num threads clause on the parallel region. So you can use either of those to for, for more control if you want to. Okay. So it's possible to do uh, to do really messy stuff if you want. Okay. Um, so you could say, okay, I could um, say, okay, I want I could call OMP set num threads to two. So I will use, in this case, I'll use two threads for this outer parallel loop. So each, uh, this loop has four iterations. So each of those threads will do two iterations each. Okay. And then I could pre-compute some values of the number of threads that I want. Uh, so once I'm inside the outer parallel region, I can again call OMP set num threads. Uh, and so for every instance, okay, so there'll be, so each thread is going to encounter this inner parallel region twice. Okay, so actually I have as much control as I, every instance of this parallel region on every thread could potentially create a different number of threads um, with this kind of mechanism. Uh, so you know, quite why you want to do that is, uh, maybe a bit, it's a bit of a bit of a corner case, but but you do have that that uh, uh, that much control if you want if you want it. Uh, and the other uh, the other alternative mechanism is to use the num threads clause on the on the parallel region. Okay. So they 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 both achieve the same thing. Uh, which should you use? That's really kind of a software engineering concern um, because uh, if with the, with the set num threads clause, uh, 
So the set num threads call, this can be anywhere in the program, okay? So this doesn't have to be in the same program unit, it doesn't have to be in the same function as the, as the parallel region. You can call this anywhere previously in the, in the program. Um, so it allows you to have control, which is uh, you don't need to pass things into the functions that can actually contain the parallel regions and so on. So if you have a, a code that's maybe structured a bit like a library and stuff, then, then this might be a more convenient mechanism. Um, on the other hand, you might want to be, uh, you know, if you're messing around with the number of threads in parallel regions, sometimes it's quite good to make it, make it explicit you know, when you get to the parallel region, how many threads you're asking for. Um, it's possible to write uh, obscure code where the, uh, the set num threads call is buried away somewhere. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to, to figure out. It can be difficult to read the code and figure out what's actually happening. Um, I remember seeing a case once where uh, it was actually a hybrid MPI plus OpenMP program, and the, uh, the performance was terrible, and we couldn't work out why uh, setting the environment variable didn't seem to, to make any difference. Um, setting, uh, setting OMP num threads didn't seem to make any difference to what was happening. Uh, and eventually, you know, by scraping around through the, through the depths of the code, buried somewhere away in some obscure routine was an explicit, uh, was a hard-coded OMP set num thread 16. Okay, so that was just overriding anything that was in the anything that was in the environment variable, and was oversubscribing the the, the, the cores and uh, and causing the bad performance. Okay. so it's a little bit using OMP set, set num threads is a little bit dangerous uh, in that in that sense. You can it's easy to uh, uh, make it a, it's easy to put it in an obscure place where nobody's going to notice that you're doing it. There we go. So you have these two mechanisms. Uh, so it's really a software engineering choice as to, uh, as to which is, is better to use. Okay. So with nested parallelism, it's very easy to get you in a situation where you could uh, generate um, more threads than you have cores, hardware cores or uh, hardware threads available to execute them. So you can, uh, you can also control the, the maximum number of threads that are running at any one time. So that's an environment variable, OMP thread limit. So if I set OMP thread limit, say, to, to 64, because I've got a 64 core machine, for example, then that will always, the, the runtime will never try to run more than 64 threads at the same time. Okay, so if it encounters a nested parallel uh, region, and there's already 64 threads executing, then it will just go ahead and execute that with a single thread. And you can also control the maximum depth of nesting that's being used as well. Okay, so it's OMP max active levels. Um, and there's also a, a runtime library function for that as well. And then there's a bunch of utility routines that allow you to navigate the, the tree of parallelism here. So uh, if you want to know what level of parallelism you're at, you can call OMP get level. So that re returns the level of parallelism in the calling thread. So that re uh, in the sequential part of the program, so if you're outside in the master thread, outside any, any parallel regions, that will return zero. Then in the first level of nesting, it returns one, second level returns two, and so on. Uh, get active level, level does more or less the same thing, but it ignores level which are uh, levels which are inactive. So what's an inactive level? Uh, the, this is a term in the specification. A team that only contains one thread is called an inactive level of parallelism. Okay. So this one only counts uh, levels where you've actually generated additional threads uh, and ignores ones where you haven't. 
you can then uh, basically uh, say, okay, you want to know what your thread ID was, okay, uh, at some level higher up in the tree. So you can basically say, okay, uh, for any given level, you can say, what was the thread number that generated the parallel region that eventually generated this thread? So particularly if you want your parent thread ID, you would call OMP get level, subtract one, and then pass that to get, get ancestor thread num. Uh, and you can also get the team sizes as well. So you can find out all the available information at different, different levels of the tree up, up above you, above this thread. Okay. Um, so somebody already mentioned collapse clause. Okay, so there's this particular use case um, which is perfectly nested rectangular loops. Okay, so it's just again un unpack what that means. Perfectly nested means that there are that all the statements are inside the innermost loop. Okay, so there aren't any code statements between the loops, either at the beginning or, or at the end here. Okay, so all the, all the executable statements are, are inside, the, uh, inside all the loops. The rectangular bit means that the loop bands of the inner loop don't depend on the iterators of the outer loop, okay? So for example, if instead it's, so instead of J less than N here, if I had J less than I, that would not be a rectangular loop, and I couldn't use uh, collapse for that. Um, but for this particular use case, then, you know, which pre you know, at one point uh, earlier on in OpenMP, the only way you could do this was to use nested parallel fours. Uh, this, uh, it's, it's better to use the, the collapse clause. So what does this do? Okay, it basically says, so the argument here is the number of loops to collapse, uh, counting in from the outside. Okay, so it doesn't have to, you don't have to collapse, you know, if I had three or four loops in the nest, I don't have to collapse all of them. Um, you know, maybe some of them aren't, maybe some of them aren't parallelizable um, because they have, uh, they don't have, it. there's some dependency between the iterations. So what, that's, what this is going to do is it will form a single loop. So in this case, it'll, it'll transform these two loops into one long loop of, of, with n times n iterations in it. And it will then basically take that implicit long loop and, uh, and treat that as the thing that, that the, the for directive applies to. So it'll parallelize and apply sh any schedule clauses to that in implicit long loop. So this is good for you know it's cases where you know if if n is you know is order of the number of threads but may, but not exactly the number of threads, then this this can be useful because you might not you know if you just parallelize the outer loop then you wouldn't get good load balance. You might have you know, n slightly less than the number of threads, then some threads are going to be idle. If n slightly more than the number of threads, then you're going to end up with some threads doing one iteration and other threads doing two iterations. Um, and so for this particular pattern, it's, this is going to be more efficient than, than using nested teams. Okay? So you could do this with, uh, with nested parallel fours. Um, but the uh, but it's better to use collapse if you can because that's uh, uh, so it's a, a it's a lower lower overhead construct. And then finally, the other thing we have to worry about in uh, in nested parallelism is how the synchronization works. Okay, uh, so. For barriers, so whether that's explicit barrier directives or implicit barriers at the end of work sharing loops, they always only affect the innermost enclosing parallel region. So 
So there's no way to have a barrier that operates across multiple teams. On the other hand, uh, essentially critical regions and atomics and locks affect all the threads in the program. Okay. So they, you know, a critical region is mutual exclusion by from all threads, regardless of, of which team they belong to in, in the nest. Um, so if you want mutual exclusion within a team, but not across teams, then you probably might need to use locks. You'd need to create a separate lock for every inner team, or maybe you can use atomics if that's a, applicable to that particular case. Okay. That's all I have to say. Uh, as I say, the, it, it does exist. I think the use cases are relatively uncommon, um, but could be useful if you have hierarchy, a hierarchy of parallelism, uh, and you really want some uh, control. So you know, maybe particularly for if you if you want to, to if you want to try and exploit uh, large core count systems with OpenMP, um, then and have you know, have control over have some you know, uh, and you want to map your team structure to the hardware. So maybe you've got you know, you know shared caches or Numa regions. That uh, within your within your system that you that you want to to very carefully map your um, parallelism to the to the hardware then then nested parallelism is, is is perhaps an option but I think in in general the use cases are, are relatively rare. Any any questions about that? Hi, Mark. Um, a quick question: um, Is it a requirement, or is it just a, a normal to expect uh, that uh, OMP uh, program compiled with without OMP uh, flux, so as a as a serial, will produce the same result? different time but the result should do you expect that result is the same or not thank you okay so let's be a little, need to be a little bit careful about so if you if if you have a program with no no open mp directives in it yes or, yeah just a serial code yeah no, as a serial program yeah. uh -huh. okay uh, i'll, I'll I'll cover that this I'll, I will talk about this this afternoon okay but yeah. there are the it's possible that just adding the open MP flag may break your code okay yeah okay it mm -hmm. can cause it to crash or potentially or uh, it could be there are circumstances where it can expose bugs in your code that. Yes. Yeah, I understand this. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can. It can. Uh, the other reason why I say we'll talk about more about this afternoon. It can cause you to run out of stack space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So okay. compiling with OpenMP typically uses uh, typically increases the amount of stack space that your program uses, uh, and that can cause a crash. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, this afternoon I'll talk about how you deal with that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lorenzo. Yeah. Hi. Sorry, I'm gonna keep pushing you on uh, on another locality. Um, yeah. Because sure. yeah, the yeah, use case that you presented here is exactly what uh, what I'm being familiar with and I've been playing for the last year or so. And um, okay. one of the things we uh, we notice is we notice we experience is that the way of binding affinity to threads we have to go through hardware locality, 
and explicitly do that. I was wondering if there is, I mean, it seems that OMP4 provides some directives to binding affinity to threads. Are, how, do, how do they work? And I'll, especially I'm thinking yeah. about how to, how to you know, uh, attach different threads to different, uh, different team of threads to different NUMAs and, uh, and or different level of uh, caching. Uh, are they this yeah. granular or is still like, uh, you know, other locality provides a, a better interface? Okay, so the, uh, sorry, this, I will talk about this later on, I think. Okay. Yes, I will. Um, so the, um, the OMP, uh, the environment variables, the, um, OMP, the, the binding and the uh, OMP places environment variables, you can use those to, uh, to, to bind your, to say how you want your threads bound if you have nested parallelism. Uh, so there is a mechanism for doing that. Um, it might not do what you want. <laughs> Okay, we might, you know, it might not do exactly what you might not do exactly what you want. And it's, you also have to worry about uh, if you're running, if you're running under a batch system, then who really has control? Okay, because it's possible for the OpenMP runtime to do binding. It's also possible for your batch system to do binding as well. And it's not always clear or obvious how those two mechanisms interact with each other. Yeah, yeah we, we also noticed that, you know, when we changed, uh, you know, uh, when, we, when we tried to do nested parallelism, we tried to do it in a, in a kind of a worker thread away from the master thread to avoid the, the rest of the execution of the program. So then, because, you know, all these settings affects the entire, you know, the entire master thread. So it's safer to work on like specific area by spawning a thread and just working in that. Otherwise, you know, you might have, especially in a, in a process, in a, in a, in a system where we have like a number of different programs that interact with each other. Right. You no. Know, so yeah, all those yeah. things, you know, you, 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 it's, it's yeah. sometimes you know, you, you don't know who actually has control. Like I confirm that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there are cases where you know, if you, if you, you know, if you've got, uh, if you really want fine level control and you've got multiple applications running uh, and you've also got kind of non-symmetric things going on. So, you know, if you have, uh, you know, if you have different, uh, different team sizes, um, then it can be, you know, the, the OpenMP mechanism may not, may not be sufficient to, to, to do what you want. So you might, you might just have to go to explicit. You might just have to go straight to operating system calls to do your binding for you. Then. Might, might, you might need to do that. Any other questions? Okay, so um, a bit behind schedule. Uh, still, uh, still got the um, memory model uh, material to to get through this morning. Um, but I think what we'll do is uh, is take a break now.
um, until 11.30 uh, and then get you set up with the, uh, with the practical sessions, get you up and running with the, with the practical sessions. Um, and then I'll do the, I'll do the memory model material uh, so just, just before lunchtime. Okay, so um, yeah, let's let's give ourselves a, a, a break for a break for twenty minutes and uh, and come back to the practical sessions at uh, at eleven thirty. <laughs> 